and uh, even in case of positive intrathoracic pressure assure the positive pressure ventilation it will reduce the venous return and then preload will be reduced what about contractility the strength of myocardial contractility depends upon the filling volume and the pressure and the maturity and integrity of myocardium because in neonatal the integrity and maturity of myocardium plays a crucial role in contractility uh, so reduced in preload as i mentioned Uh, it will happen in the hypovolemia, cardiac arrhythmia. It will happen, or uh, also in premature teen, maybe in immaturity babies, when we reduce the preload, and the hypoxic infants and infections will all will all affect the contractility and also the preload. What is the importance of afterload? If the cardiac afterload is like very high, means the myocardium, the immature myocardium of the extreme premature neonate, or the premature neonates is having uh, the ability to contract and pump against the High the, the, the resistance, uh, it will be like uh, the pump may be compromised and the cardiac output may fall. So the increase in afterload may happen uh, by some mechanism like increased endogenous catecholamine release during immediate postnatal adoption. Uh, like uh, when the in utero there the placental circulation will be low resistance, and then <clears throat> suddenly it will adapt to the high resistance after the uh, postnatal circulation. The, if the myocardium is not uh, uh, having the ability to contract against the afterload, it will produce the cardiac output, reduce the uh, reduce cardiac output and cause cardiac failure and shock. <coughs> also, the other factors like uh, uh, hypovolemia, hypothermia, and high dose of vasopressors. If we if we are giving giving high dose of vasopressors, which is a good response to heart, it will produce the further stress on the afterload. So uh, even the in in a different use of high dose of vasopressors may again affect the cardiac contractility and the afterload. What are the consequences of afterload? If the right ventricular output is very low, what is going to happen due to high vas pulmonary vascular resistance? The amount of blood will be. Only one cup. One cup. Okay. 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 Hello. Ah, because so the right ventricular output is going to be low due to high pulmonary vascular resistance. The amount of blood will be going to the lungs, uh, the traversing the lungs to the left ventricle will be reduced, leading to low systemic blood flow. High after load can affect the either ventricle, either right or left ventricle, and the output of both uh, or one of the ventricles can be reduced. It will affect the function of the other ventricle. For example, the ductal chunks are all closed. Yeah. So the one one uh, high afterload of uh, right ventricle may affect the left ventricle and also produce the uh, output failure. So this we see the, uh, the, uh, the picture showing the multiple factors affecting the uh, shock. Like we see the systemic blood pressure plays an important role, and uh, we see the uh, <coughs> systemic resistance playing an important role here. Uh, and uh, this means the Monitored systemic blood pressure being monitored with the uh, uh, arterial line pressure transducer and systemic resistance that could be treated with the vasopressors and the loose vitro flight, and then <clears throat> systemic oxygen delivery and systemic oxygen consumption, and uh, importantly systemic flow. Uh, all these is a uh, uh, complex things involved in the shock uh, uh, shock mechanism. <clears throat> so as you see in the graph, like when the oxygen delivery to the tissues is going to reduce, reduce, reduce. is showing in this x axis uh, in this we show the normal range of oxygen delivery the tissues are maintaining the proper oxygen consumption and further the oxygen delivery reduces the compensatory uh, phase will happen like increased capillary recruitment and the tissues will have increased capillary recruitment and increased oxygen extraction will happen but after a certain amount the critical do2 is falls to a certain critical state they after that the compensatory mechanism fails and produces the lactic acidosis So hypovolemic shock, uh, as we know, is a very very uh, common thing, uh, important for uh, the capacity for uh, neonatal shock. It's due to, as we know, the insufficient circulating blood volume and further reduction of cardiac output. Uh, neonatal shock in uh, uh, due to hypovolemia is most commonly due to hemorrhage. So hypovolemia, we can say absolute and relative. Absolute is hemorrhagic, uh, like in blood loss, fetal placental hemorrhage, fetal maternal hemorrhage, umbilical cord avulsion during the perinatal event. These are the perinatal events. Abdominal hemorrhage, also hepatic subcapillary hematoma after birth injury. Non hemorrhage will be like capillary leak, uh, excessive intensive water loss, and diarrhea. 
but the relative hypovolemia uh, may be in case of uh, uh, pandemic inflammatory response syndrome and medications what are the changes in the neonatal myocardium why the neonatal myocardium is not uh, able to handle the uh, high afterload after birth because in particularly in this immature myocardium has a high basal contractile stage and has higher sensitivity to changes in the afterload for example from low vascular resistance state in in utero it transits to high vascular resistance state at birth but unfortunately this neonatal myocardium has a very fewer contractile elements and uh, which will not cope uh, cope up in uh, extreme premature or very premature babies if uh, the neonatal myocardium cannot cope up to the high vascular resistance state at birth it will produce the additional cardiac output so as we this is myocardial dysfunction abnormal peripheral vascular regulation and hypovolemia uh, these two uh, all, all will uh, decrease will reach to, leading to the decreased delivery of oxygen and nutrient to the tissues uh, are often the sources of the primary source of neonatal shock so these three may play an important role in neonatal the myocardial dysfunction abnormal peripheral vascular regulation and also hypovolemia but uh, in very premature infant this these three scenario will be complicated by relative adrenal insufficiency that is often we see in the premature infant that will add up to the fuel in this uh, neonatal shock issue so as uh, this is myocardial dysfunction there is both systolic and my diastolic dysfunction can cause the circulatory failure systolic dysfunction can cause in cardiomyopathy post artificial myocardial dysfunction due to hie and viral myocarditis and myocardial dysfunction in case late stages of septic shock Diastolic dysfunction can happen in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, in case of infant or diabetic mothers, and also extrinsic factors like uh, pericardial effusion, which will produce the tamp, produce the tamponade, and then tension in the right, which will produce the diastolic. Both leads to severe my myocardial dysfunction. <coughs> uh, we have already said that preterm infants are anatomically and functionally they are very immature myocardium, so they are very much prone, more prone to systolic dysfunction that is more common than the diastolic. So there is a normal inverse relationship between the heart rate, <coughs> corrected velocity of sub-temperature shortening, and the wall stress. Uh, so uh, if the wall is going to highly stress, again, uh, that is an induction of after uh, uh, wall stress is an induction of afterload. It will be irreversibly going to affect the heart rate. Uh, so other mechanisms of shock, like in PPH and babies, we have supra-systemic pulmonary vascular resistance. Which is in the prenatal pre period, it is uh, further going to continue in the postnatal period, and then in case of uh, ongoing hypoxia and acidosis from sepsis, all will lead to the PPHN and right ventricular failure. Uh, in case of closure of ductus arteriae, the ventricular closure of ductus arteriosus in this in case of very ductal dependent congenital artery such as in cross ventricular infusion uh, in such cases the cross ventricular infusion may be needed to open and maintain the patency of ductus arteriosus that's also so much babies so heart rate how the heart rate is going to be uh, involved in this uh, cardiac output is when there is a significant bradycardia poor cardiac output will happen excessive tachycardia there will be impact diastolic filling and also impact coronary blood flow this will all produce impact cardiac dysfunction and produce a poor cardiac output. In case of mild cardiac output, mild tachycardia, the cardiac output will be little increased. This is the relation between heart rate and cardiac output. <clears throat> we need to know about the PCO2 and peripheral auto regulation. Uh, in ventilator, we are very much concerned we should not have the PCO2 wash out. Uh, so, uh, the factors that impair the cerebral and uh, other organ blood flow auto regulation will be uh, like butter, acidosis, and infection. And the also hypoglycemia, tissue hypoxia, and ischemia, and sudden alteration in the arterial uh, carbon dioxide tension. As so you see, the importance of uh, PCO2 is like uh, one millimeter change, uh, one mm um, uh, change in PCO2 will result in four percent change in cerebral blood flow. For example, it will it will be more 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 important than the blood pressure. As you see, a one mm uh, mercury of change in blood pressure will produce only one to two percent change in cerebral blood flow. Uh, it, uh, the, the changes are more reflected in the PCO2, the PHCO2. Uh, so the, we don't, we doesn't want the PHCO2 wash out. If the PHCO2 wash out, 
So if the baby is going to be respond good with the dopamine, uh, the the risk of IVF is much reduced in this operation. What are the limitations we find in the B correlating B two with the neonatal child? <clears throat> For example, if the normal blood pressure in the first twenty four hours may not guarantee cerebral normal cerebral perfusion because the cerebral blood pressure is always influenced by the ductal shunts in the baby. So that they say that if the baby is even normal blood pressure can be found, it may not guarantee the normal cerebral perfusion. And blood pressure again, uh, alone. Maybe in in case of underdiagnosed compensated phase of that we will miss. If we from a point if we see only blood pressure, we will miss the underdiagnosed compensated phase. And also the intraarterial assessment before the, and the doctor shunting may not allow the assumption that the ventricular output is an accurate measure. So this uh, this intraarterial and doctor shunting will definitely have an effect on the BP and the ventricular output. <clears throat> How about the urine output in correlating neonatal child? Even output is low in the first postnatal day because there is a delivery associated increase in stress hormones like catecholamines, renin, angiotensin, vasopressin. This is definitely cause renal vasoconstriction and increased tubular reabsorption of sodium and water. After the first two to three days, this decrease in urine output may be the earliest clinical sign of compensated shock. So they say first first postnatal day we cannot correlate the urine output with the shock. And very preterm infants have a um, good correlation between low SVC flow and then subsequent low urine output and hyperkalemia. That usually they say in the first uh, after the first postnatal day, the two to three days they have good correlation uh, between the low urine output and low SVC flow. So what about lactic acidosis and neonatal shock? For example, uh, there's a specificity of ninety. The CRT, uh, if you're combining as uh, more than four seconds with the elevated serum lactate concentration of more than four mm mol per liter, a specificity of 97 percent reflecting the low SVC flow in the very low birth weight neonates. So, if the CRT more than four seconds and lactate more than four uh, mm mol per liter, you find maybe the correlation of the low SVC flow in the first postnatal day will be a better way of identifying the neonatal hypertension in the first day. And rising lactate levels have a more adverse outcome. Uh, then a very early, early high value. If we if we, if we say the rising lactate level, even the first day we see the high lactate level, and then the mid day. So the lactate level rising trend is very important in predicting the outcome, adverse outcome in the baby. मतलब वो अगर वो rising है ऐसे को ये कहीं की पहले वो peripheral and temperature difference like uh, how it will be correlated with the neonatal shock. In preterm neonates less than 30 weeks, there is no relationship between the core peripheral and temperature difference and the SVC flow. So they have found out there is no much correlation between this one and top. <clears throat> As you see, these are the parameters we measure: systemic perfusion, systemic oxygenation, CO2 status, regional perfusion, peripheral perfusion. These are the multiple parameters to measure the neonatal shock. Indirect assessment of perfusion due to the CBAC, the CRT here. And then organ function uh, due to amplitude EEG. These are all the parameters, uh, multiple parameters I see in this table to uh, assess the neonatal shock. How important is the SVC flow in the neonatal shock? Low SVC flow is being strongly associated with the subsequent IVH and neurodevelopmental impairment they have found out in multiple studies. So uh, the ACCM guidelines they say definitely if you get an adequate SVC flow. It is one of the therapeutic endpoints that your shock has been treated. So the SVC flow is definitely a good target marker for the systemic blood flow. Uh, in uh, it, it would have a good insight in the hemodynamic events in, uh, during the immediate postnatal period when there is a shunting across the fetal channel. Because when there is a lot of shunting happens in the fetal channel, there will be a difficulty in measuring the blood pressure and also the left ventricular output. Also, measurement will be different in this baby. In these babies, SVC flow is have a good surrogate for Systemic blood flow measurement. As you see in the slide, uh, we see the SVC flow uh, estimation. Uh, I mentioned it's uh, uh, it's an estimate to measure the systemic flow in the early postnatal period. The normal range in the well preterm babies is 40 and 120 ml per kg per minute. It's a median rising from 70 ml per kg per minute at five hours to 90 ml per kg at 40 hours. This is the echo diagram showing the uh, SVC flow. Uh, the subcostal view.
So the SVC Doppler we, we measured the we is the S wave. We get the D wave and the A wave. So these three are the important waves we should find in the normal SVC. Uh, <clears throat> In studies, they have given the normal day one. They have okay. found out seventy six ml per kg per minute, and the, in the day two they found out the SVC is ninety three ml per kg per minute. These are the SVC parameters they mentioned in the table, and also the value for the very twenty uh, five uncomplicated, very pre. Next taken record. Next to put study. Next taken record. Taken. You say it is outside. He actually on the poor young man. Madam, I can I can even mute the audio because I am hearing your multiple voices. Pooja, this is the flow at five hours above is sixty two, and then twelve hours seventy five, and twenty four hours eighty two and eighty six. How uh, we can see that the uh, uh, slowly increasing trend of HPC in this over forty eight hours above. Which data? So how to involve the echo cardiogram in the identification of the neonatal shock? Uh, Madam, someone is voice in the chat. I mean, in the, can you can you move, please? Uh, how the echocardiographic assessment in the shock is first is eyeballing, like how uh, by uh, assessing the cardiac filling, and then the IVC assessment, and then the important comes is the uh, how to quantitative uh, quantity assess the pulmonary hypertension. That we show in further slides how the interventricular septum is being flattened. And also the fast assessment of the pulmonary hypertension by the PAP pressure by TR jet, jet gradient, <coughs> and also the assessment of the cardiac function by fractional shortening and TAPSI. <coughs> Here we see them uh, in the uh, view like uh, normal LV shape interventricular septum is noted, and we can see how the LV septum uh, LV shape is being compromised in the flattened interventricular septum in the PPHM. If there is a pericardial effusion, as I said, there will be a big collection of an, uh, effusion fluid will be there around the heart. It will go into compressed heart. In the apical core chamber view, we can see the uh, pericardial effusion fluid here. <clears throat> How to assess the cardiac uh, filling by eyeballing is we see that the hypolemia, uh, there will be contracted chambers, and we can see the volume overload, there will be dilated chambers. So, this is eyeballing way, visual assessment, we can see the chamber filling. And also in the black view, you can see how much the left ventricle is being compromised, very, very low filling. And overloading, we can see how much the left ventricle is being dilated. So the IVC filling is another marker in echo for the neutral shock. We can see in inspiration, the minute the uh, minimum will be there, and then the expiration maximum will be there. So that much we can see the uh, IVC filling in the shock issue. PRJ estimation, as we know, is in the apical core chamber. They have kept in the Doppler reading. How nicely the TRJ uh, test uh, can get it. And then this is the estimate for pulmonary epidemic. Another one important uh, parameter is this functional cardiac MRI. This now became the gold standard for measuring the cardiac output. This study uh, by Alan M. Groves and, uh, uh, and et al. They have given the use of functional cardiac MRI in free time and term newborns. But we can here in this slide we can show uh, see the four, four chamber uh, and the short axis views in the A and B. Uh, this is the left ventricle and this is the right ventricle shown in the four chamber view. And this is short axis view of the, uh, the cardiac MRI showing the left and right ventricle. So uh, <clears throat> they have given normograms in this study how the left ventricle output will be there and the character distribution is. They they are going to see whether it's uh, falling in this normogram. And also the right ventricle output nomogram is there, SVC flow nomogram is there, and then uh, these flows are all um, uh, uh, being the nomograms used in cardiac MRI. Other nomograms also I mentioned. Left ventricular end systolic volume nomogram, left ventricular ejection fraction nomogram, and left ventricular end diastolic volume nomogram, left ventricular output nomogram. According to the character distribution we they are mentioned. Another novel thing is uh, what we rarely use is electrical impedance elasimetry. This uh, measures left cardiac output by continuous and non invasive measurement by thoracic electrical bioimpedance formula. Like they are going to attach an electrode, <coughs> inner sensor, and outer sensor. The outer sensor is going to transmit the current, inner sensor will measure the impedance. And we will get a graph like this, and then the, they are going to evaluate with the formula. 
This is very rarely used in Unix, so I, I we no need to explain it. All. So this is a study is in Thermair. Uh, they at all they have found out the isolated hypotension first three days of life. Uh, the associated with the short term outcome. Epiphage uh, two cohort study. They matched 119 extremely preterm with the untreated isolated hypotension to 119 treated infants in the first three post initial days. This, they found out the hypotension they uh, uh, defined as mean blood pressure 5 millimeter below the gestation age in weeks. So they found out the extremely uh, preterm babies who have been treated properly with the uh, hypotension, they have good out outcome and their uh, the babies are better. Neurodevelopmental impairment is low. So what are the treatments we know about the shock management? This first is volume administration. Before before uh, uh, going to vascular process and inotropes, we will always should the first give importance to the volume administration. Uh, so we say whether the bolus is good or not. Uh, that I will discuss later. So expansion of the blood volume initially in the labor room, this delayed umbilical cord clamping has a very good uh, or cord milking will have a good improvement in the systemic hemodynamics in the return. So wherever possible, the uh, umbilical cord clamping will be a better for the baby's hemodynamics. <clears throat> As we see in this, myocardial dysfunction will frequently contribute to the development and neonatal uh, hypertension. We should be very careful in aggressively giving volume to these myocardial dysfunction uh, babies. So this, if the yeah, babies yeah, are yeah. found with myocardial dysfunction, but, uh, we uh, will aggressively replace, we will reduce that to pulmonary cardiovascular, gas conditioning and central nervous system morbidity. So aggressive bolus should be very, very carefully monitored and should be avoided in the extreme treatment uh, infants, which will produce a further morbidity in these babies. <clears throat> As we see in the, in case of blood loss, they say better we could actually put the packed RBC after the initial crystalloid or colloid bolus. <laughs> or the packed RBC with the fresh portion plasma with the hematocrit around 65 is the recommendation. As it is volume replacement fluids, we say some uh, many centers are used using plasma like here. In our uh, setup, we are not using, we are mainly focusing on 0.9% NACL. As you see, the pH of this plasma day, plasma day is 7.4 and the 0.9 NACL is 5.5. 5% 5. 5. Uh, 5 albumin is very, very uh, having a poor uh, uh, in the maintaining mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. mm -hmm. avoided in our uh, setup. Not in the spirit, doctor. Uh -huh. So, doctor, no, 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 70 no. and we have about 80. That's, uh, what about dopamine? Yeah, it, uh, we need to know what is the uh, importance of dopamine okay, in the yeah. drug. This uh, drug will reduce increases in myocardial contact with it. Madam, someone can use uh, yes. the audio. Uh, use their audio. Hey, Madam. Where is the machine? Uh, so the drug induced. Uh, <coughs> The dopamine will definitely increase the myocardial contractility and also <coughs> peripheral vascularization after load. These are the most important factors in increasing the systemic blood pressure. The recommended dose is 2 to 20 mg per kg per minute. In hypotensive preterm units with a significant electrolyte shunting across the PDA, dopamine administration has been documented with increased systemic blood pressure, pulmonary pressure, and SVC flow. What about dobutamine? Dobutamine is relatively cardioselective, sympathomimetic. It is significant alpha and beta adrenal receptor. They have direct inotropic effect but limited chronotropic effect. Myocardial norepinephrine stores are immature and depleted uh, <coughs> in the newborn. So there will be no use of much norepinephrine in newborn. So who is going to be more benefited with the dobutamine treatment? Newborns with the primary myocardial dysfunction and elevated peripheral vascular resistance. They are very, very going to be useful in used in case of dopamine treatment. As we know from this word, like elevated uh, dopamine has tendency to reduce its peripheral vascular resistance, which is not that right. So what is the dopamine is the dopamine, which to go first. In many studies have found out dopamine is more effective than dopamine in increasing the birth rate in the preterm infant. So meta-analysis of these studies confirmed that dopamine was more successful than the dopamine. 
so the most effect is the combination of dopamine or mildenone and low dose dopamine to achieve their goals of maintaining blood pressure and systemic blood flow in the acceptable ranges epinephrine epinephrine shows to increase the blood flow blood pressure and peripheral blood flow and hypotensive very low blood weight units epinephrine has a significant effect on glycogenolysis and epinephrine is also correlated with a very uh, it's an increase in serum lactate levels independent of the drug's cardiac action so epinephrine side effects they mention is increase in serum lactate so this and analysis on the use of epinephrine versus dopamine in patients with the pediatric and neonatal tract they showed the similar efficacy both epinephrine and dopamine are showed similar efficacy in the three available rtcs uh, very low birth weight infants for which baby epinephrine is going to be useful very low birth weight infants with the dopamine resistant hypotension epinephrine administration will be good in improving their blood pressure and also the uh, heart rate and also no uh, they got no effect on the urine output and also this epinephrine uh, can even worsen the metabolic acidosis as well there is an uh, other issues worsening metabolic acidosis and also as i mentioned in the previous slide we're going to use a serum lactate so they say when there is a baby is an epinephrine uh, uh, their serum lactate is there we cannot correlate properly with the child <coughs> About what about norepinephrine? As I mentioned, the neonatal migraine has very few norepinephrine receptors. But uh, one recent report, retrospective study uh, of the preterm infant, they say the septic and refractory hypotension uh, to epinephrine or dopamine. They reported improvement in blood pressure and urine output, but no change in pH or base deficit eight hours after initiating norepinephrine therapy. So both the uh, non-responders, epinephrine and dopamine, they, they say norepinephrine has showed improvement in blood pressure and urine output. Mildred knows uh, this is mainly an afterload reducing agent in units with a cardiac congenital cardiac disease with a low cardiac output, and also after surgery is going to be very useful. The preferential effect of mildred known on the pulmonary circulation in units with a PPHN treated with the INO is is a very good uh, very good effect of uh, so mildred known has been shown in these babies with the treated with the INO PPHN babies. Is due to the upregulation of PDE3 in the pulmonary vessels in due to response to INO. So INO will be a primary mode of treatment, PPHN, and then after load reducing agent, uh, this mildenone will go to an additive effect for reducing the after load. <clears throat> so uh, this, uh, what are the side effects of mildenone? Arterial hypotension, first thing, and second thing, thrombocytopenia are the most common noted adverse effects with the mildenone. They found out. Uh, the mildenone and the placebo group comparison in the study they showed that there is no improvement in the incidence of uh, uh, low SVC flow, uh, which is used as a target of systemic blood flow. They say mildenone does not improve the low SVC flow in this study. Vasopressin. Vasopressin mainly action due to the uh, stimulation of V1 A receptor. This will have the vasoconstrictive effects on the systemic vascular blood and renal efferent arterioles. As a next slide, I will show uh, this V1A receptor stimulation also leads to platelet aggregation. This slide will uh, show the effects of vasopressin. Like you see, in V1A receptor, we, we very well know vasopressin will reduce the urine output, but the V1A receptor will produce increased diuresis also. And also, the V1A receptor, as I say, the vascular smoothness and constriction will increase the blood pressure. And the same V1A receptor will produce the Plated aggregation and also release of coagulation factors. Even B receptor is going to act on increased cortisol and increased insulin. These are the whole uh, things of uh, vasopressin effects. So, which patients are going to benefit from vasopressin is neonates with the pulmonary hypertension, including patients with the uh, congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Vasopressin is a very good uh, candidate for treatment of circulatory failure. If the um, primary pathophysiology is that of vasodilatation in case of septic shock without myocardial dysfunction. So we can see septic shock vasodilatation patient without myocardial dysfunction or in SIR, systemic inflammatory response following cardiac surgery. These are the uh, scenario which vasopressin have a very good effect. He writes, small RCT shows low dose hydrocodone improve the blood pressure, but it was less effective than the dopamine. 
so they say a low dose hydrocortisone improve but still less effective mechanism is many mechanisms that desensitization of the cardiac system to cardiac elements because as we say in case of critical illness babies there will be the catecholamine response will be very poor in the cardiovascular system because there will be desensitization of the receptor but this process will be reduced or attenuated or prevented by the regulatory action of the glucocorticoid the response to a catecholamine will be improved by the steroids and very low birth weight in units we see adrenal response and responsiveness will be there uh, to the endogenous or exogenous acth and in late preterm and term unit there will be unresponsive of hypothalamic pituitary axis to stress so this type of adrenal response and responsiveness and the hpa axis and responsiveness will be uh, addressed by the steroids all the mechanism of action of steroids they increase the myocardial contractility and also they maintain the capillary integrity they inhibit the catecholamine metabolism and the intake of reuptake of norepinephrine into the sympathetic nerve ending and also increase the expression of angiotensin 2 receptor and inhibit the process cycling production and the induction of in inducible nitric oxide this is all going to improve the shock and the myocardial contractility and maintain the capillary integrity these are the effects of steroids hydrocortisone studies they say <coughs> Uh, the, the result of examining the structural and functional brain development, what they say, the hydrocortisone usage and the uh, further brain development, any issues that they study. Hydrocortisone, which was used in the treatment of bronchopulmonary patient, ventilator dependent three term units, they are at the median of 18 days and the cumulative days of work, because they does not interfere with the brain development in studies. So, hydrocortisone, the study they have given, there is no, not interfering with the brain development. In five to seven year follow up of small RCT, they said early hydrocortisone in BPD, they, uh, they showed a lower performance in interesting process. This is a different study from the previous study I mentioned. They mentioned in the small RCT, they have a the lower intelligence question, higher need of physiotherapy in the hydrocortisone group. Another case control study has been done. They said there is no difference in the cerebral and cerebellar tissue volumes in MRI. In the term equivalent in the preterm infant treated with the hydrocortisone. So there are controversies like one study saying lower performance of the IQ and the other says there is no uh, difference in the brain development. Still more studies to be needed in this hydrogen. So another last uh, thing is ECMO support. Whether veno vena ECMO or veno uh, arterial ECMO is going to help is first is veno arterial ECMO is going to help because it drains blood from the venous system uh, the, through the HIV and then returns to the arterial system by the arterial cannula on the right common carotid artery. This very much useful uh, vena arterial ECMO will be useful in refractive septic shock and acute myocarditis with a severe mitral dysfunction and low cardiac output following the repair of congenital heart defects and severe hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients in, uh, in, in the infant born to diabetic mothers. These are the things where they will use vena arterial ECMO. How about vena venous ECMO? They have less uh, value in improving the systemic blood flow. Uh, so, vena vena ECMO, they improve the cardiac function in one way by reducing the pulmonary vascular resistance uh, in conditions such as PPHN with uh, circulatory failure. Wherein the elevated pulmonary vascular resistance is a big problem in producing the circulatory collapse. This condition, the vena 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 ECMO can improve the cardiac function. But in direct improvement of systemic blood flow or systemic uh, blood uh, 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 systemic blood issue, Vena arterial ECMO is high value. So as we know, we have the goal directed treatment, like we have to identify the proper pathology, septic shock, or respiratory issue, PPHN or CHD, or hypovolemic or metabolic. As per this guidelines, we have to do and uh, address the uh, other issues like pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, and uh, in this SSPDA. And the normal goals they have mentioned, uh, like uh, in the cerebral venous oxygen, more than uh, 70% this is an NIRS in a finding and this cardiac output index should be 3.3. These are the goals they mentioned, the SVC flow goals. So accordingly, this uh, management will differ. So these are the references I have taken. Thank you.
Oh, no. oh, has he finished? Yes, Kyo Kumar? Yes, ma'am. Finished, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Finished, huh? Yes, ma'am. Questions, you answered all the questions? Uh, ma'am, I'm answering ma in the chat. Uh, You're uh, answering now? Yeah, no. No, somebody had asked regarding the inotrope of choice in septic shock. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, ah. Septic shock is going to have the critical vasodilatation, ma'am. And then yeah. <clears throat> there will be uh, first the volume uh, we have to assess. Actually, the volume if there is a replacement. We need to replace yeah. the volume. And then yeah. there is an associated myocardial dysfunction in the associated uh, septic shock. And if the BP is maintaining in, in case of septic shock, we can go for dopamine. If there is a peripheral vessel dilatation and still BP is low, we go for dopamine. Yeah. See, nowadays the concept has changed. There is no stereotyped inotrope for septic shock, for asphyxia like that. Find out what is the reason for shock. As you said, if it is myocardial dysfunction, you have to use afterload reducing agent. Or the vasodilatory shock in sepsis, you have to use uh, inotropes which will increase your systemic blood pressure like dopamine, adrenaline, noradrenaline like that. So you can't say all asphyxia use dobutamine, yes. all sepsis use dopamine. You cannot tell like that. Yes. So what is the reason? Based on the pathophysiology only, you can titrate your inotropes. Yes. Same thing, no? What is the protocol for hypotension in day two VLBW? So day two, if it is due to PDA, you may get hypotension, you treat PDA. Or if the baby has got myocardial dysfunction, poor myocardial Reserve, but the BP is normal. You use dobutamine. So, depending on all things, only you can tell. Yes, dopamine is good in septic shock because it's a good peripheral vasoconstrictor. It improves the BP immediately very well. Yes, myocardial dysfunction always better to use an afterload reducing agent that will improve the work of your myocardium. But if there is hypotension at the same time, you are worried your BP will drop further low by using afterload reducing. You use a combination of both. Combination of dopamine and dobutamine will be good. Road of FFP. 
role of ffp is not much in shock in shock like we don't give a use ffp as a volume expander if that's what you are telling unless there is a coagulopathy a bleeding tendency using ffp as a colloidal volume expander is not been much in septic shock if you are needing more than two inotropes you can always use hydrocortisone it will improve the bp immediately dopamine versus epinephrine yeah okay yeah we do use epinephrine in our unit epinephrine will improve your bp will improve improve your myocardial performance index at the same time it will also increase your oxygen utilization your lactic acid will also go high so low dose epinephrine will be very good very quick acting in improving the myocardial performance and your bp dopamine versus epinephrine you can yeah you can decide whichever you are comfortable with always better to go with dopamine dobutamine and keep epinephrine as your third line that's what we practice in our unit yeah nor epinephrine i am not very we are not used it very often nor epinephrine if you are really in a refractory shock due to pphn or due to sepsis because it has got a little bit of pulmonary vasodilator also so refractory shock the third drug or the fourth drug would be norepinephrine for me myocardial dysfunction first would be dopamine dobutamine and if you want to increase the blood pressure you have hypotension to combat we'll use dopamine add dopamine and third we'll add epinephrine if still you are worried the perfusion is not improving bp is not improving septic shock fourth would be an hydrocortisone and very rarely we use norepinephrine more than norepinephrine we use vasopressin to improve the bp in pph so we are not very yeah vasopressin i told please vasopressin use is in pph and it is at the lowest dose higher dose will increase the pa pressure so the lowest dose possible only we'll use it it helps in pph and definitely anything more so the take home message i am telling you is don't stereotype yourself this inotrope for asphyxia this inotrope for sepsis always what is the reason is it myocardial is it peripheral vasodilatory is it volume is it pphn is it duct so based on that only you titrate your inotrope so i hope i am clear yeah vasopressin versus milrinone in pphn yeah milrinone is a very good drug yeah especially in pphn if your center doesn't have any nitric oxide always you get worried when you start milrinone you will have hypotension but don't get out of milrinone add dopamine to improve the blood pressure and continue milrinone if you have nitric oxide better nitric oxide vasopressin versus milrinone i'm telling you vasopressin is a double edged weapon you use a higher dose you tend to tilt the balance in favor of cph always use a low dose vasopressin wait for a while you will get a good bp and you will get a reversal of shunt also milrinone i have used it very well only thing don't worry about the hypotension because the minute you start milrinone your bp will drop so when compared to your pa pressure your bp is dropping so you get a right to left shunt hypotension especially when you are using invasive bp you no know? you never look at the baby you always look at the monitor and try to treat it so combat the hypotension with extra fluid and dopamine your milrinone will work very well anything more you come on yes ma'am they said post cardiac surgery Uh, shock post cardiac surgery shock yeah that's a very very different issue here they have used all these drugs in post cardiac surgery they have used lot of norepi and post cardiac surgery uh, mainly post cardiac duct suddenly you ligate the duct and whatever la you are getting you are not getting so first address the volume and mostly uh, they use dopamine dobutamine adri 
nor adri is more in favor of post cardiac surgery also thank you my experience in post cardiac surgery is only limited to pda ligation yeah when you are using multiple inotropes how do you go about tapering very uh, valid question so you have your own hierarchy of inotropes in your unit dobutamine for dysfunction followed by dopamine to improve bp and then the adrenaline and then the vasopressin and then the norepi and other things so the drugs i am not comfortable with i try to get out of early adrenaline i try to get out of early because in an extreme preterm baby it can precipitate ivh and it also increase the myocardial perf- performance inject so your oxygenation may get tossed you get a higher lactic acid your base excess will be minus negative all the time so you get worry so i just try to get out of the rare drugs earlier like if i am using norepi i try to get out if i am using adrenaline i try to. then i keep dopamine dobutamine for some time and then get out of it how yes, often how often we in face ivh in anaerobic ivh yeah when we i'm not at all for very high use of epinephrine in a way no the sudden fluctuation in blood pressure what precipitates an ivh so baby is coming in severe shock poor pulses you are just starting one or two inotropes dopamine dobutamine and all are nicely building up give some time suddenly you hit with a high dose of epinephrine suddenly the bp shoots up you should be very gradual in increasing and try to avoid the sudden up and down suddenly the bp goes very high none of you will notice that because you are happy the pulse is good the cft is good the bp is high but you are very scared to taper off so all this if you are going by ibp you have to strictly go by ibp so this fluctuation in bp is what tilts the balance and precipitate ivh if you are very careful we are very titrating slowly increasing the dose slowly and then try to come down once you have achieved your 50th centile bp in my unit when a baby enters the nicu one chart will be pasted 50th centile 50th centile 90th centile of systolic diastolic and mean deep our target is to be around the 50th centile so based on that we go up and down on the inotropes hydrocot yes refractory shock i hydrocortisone works very well first make sure you have given enough fluid without fluid no role for inotropes second is your inotropes for bp dopamine for myocardial dysfunction dobutamine you can add either of the two if both are there then you go to adrenaline to improve your bp and perfusion refractory is not adrenaline when i am using three dopamine dobutamine and adrenaline i always go for hydrocortisone because it really helps to tide over the crisis anything okay. else no, have we safety. covered everything the safety of hydrocortisone is very very premature and very risky over the hydrocortisone yeah hydrocortisone uh, see all babies who are sick they will have uh cortisol deficiency or inability to mount a cortisol response in stress so if you are thinking strongly in favor of septic shock yes even in extreme i don't use very high dose of hydrocortisone okay i just use 2 mg per kg as a normal maintenance dose that itself will help to combat your uh, adrenal crisis you yeah, are very difficult you are ibp and nbp i always keep telling you your technology should guide you you should not treat based on your technology even if your ibp is low you have to look if the waveform is okay is there any partial block in the ibp circuit whether you have zeroed you have kept it at the level of the baby's heart flush it and see if the waveform are coming see if there are any changes make sure it correlates with the baby's baby's pulse cft warm periphery urine output adequacy of fluid you can always check with your ivc if you are trending a lactate you are doing lactate again and again then that will again give you, you know if your lactate is coming down nicely you don't have to chase there is one beautiful study 
RCT on IBP and NIBP and how they have used the inotrope. They always found higher use of multiple inotropes in IBP. So what I suggest is clinical correlation. Without clinical correlation, don't blindly titrate based on your IBP value. Sclerema, I have not used hydrocortisone for the sake of sclerema. Unless there is a septic shock or some other thing to contribute to this. Usually by improving the perfusion, treating the sepsis and making a good temperature maintenance, our sclerema have come down. So many sclerema baby, just like that with conservative management we have pulled out. It is just an showing you that something is going wrong, either in temperature or sepsis. So you treat that. It is not a disease per se. Any more questions? No. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Shivakumar. Thanks. Very pleasant. Thank you all. Thank you.